Hi, Joe Cerrone. Al Rosen. We're going to go through our Chapter 3, Mastering 3D Printing. 3D printer workflow in software. And so the, the author does a good job with this book. And I really kind of like it where he says 3D printers don't work like paper printers. And they don't. They're, they're CNC machines, computer numerical controlled machines. They run on G codes. But by calling it a 3D printer, it makes everybody feel really comfortable with it because they have printing they've had experience with printing. And so as we go through and we look at what's really going on with it, we're gonna talk about how the CAD software works with that. And so they talk about workflow here. And when we talk about workflow, what we're talking about is how you go from concept to a product. And so typically, you know, we're looking at three pieces of software. We're looking at a CAD software, we're looking at a slicing software, and then we're creating it with a 3D printer. And so that's our workflow. We design it on CAD, we slice it in the slicer, and then we print it on the printer. And there's different flavors of all of these, different types of CAD software, different types of slicers, and different types of 3D printers. Models. Okay, CAD models are 3D models, essentially. And when you look at the type of 3D printed files, we're working with this STL file format. And so this is a universal language for the 3D printers and the slicing softwares. And what that does is it breaks the vertices into these triangular shaped planes for the printer to work off of. When you get really, really into it, you can create this mesh and you, you will find that you can repair them and you can use some of these CAD repair softwares. They have these programs called meshlab.net, but that's more of an advanced 3D printing application. And what we're in the process of doing is we're gonna make the basic 3D printing class like it is right now with sort of a general design feel to it. And then we're going to go into an advanced 3D printing um, where it's going to be more into the specifics of things like repairing and being able to work with troubleshooting. File repositories. This is the best, okay? Thingiverse has so many different 3D printed files. And so if I come over here and I go to THI Thingiverse or Thingiverse and I run that, this is kind of fun. You can go onto their main page and you can see what they have in the main splash page every day. Here's a garbage bag holder, you know, for recycling. They have all kinds of different projects here. If I wanted to do one of the things that I've been doing is webcam covers. Because, you know, everybody thinks that they're being recorded if there's a webcam in the room. So I I put covers on them all the time. And then my, my guys that are working, at least they don't feel like I'm spying on them. And you know what? Somebody could be. And so webcam covers are a great way to make people feel more comfortable. This one works pretty well right here. And this one is one of those printed assembled. And so what they do is the designer has this set up so that you can actually print it and then it will break the joints and it's printed assembled, which is kind of neat. Doesn't look that great in this one. It looks a little hacky, but you can finish them afterwards. So Thingiverse is a terrific website to be able to get models from. And you can go in here and you can search everything. Like uh, if I wanted to go with um, dinosaurs, you want to print out a model, you could print that out and put those things together. All kinds of applications. Here I could probably do a dinosaur chip clip. That would be kind of neat. So any, so Thingiverse is terrific. There's some of these other ones, Indestructibles, Pin Shape. I don't use them as much, but again, some great content that you can get. Scanning is quite difficult. 
I've done a little bit of work with scanners, but the meshes and things are difficult to repair. We are looking to get a, a small tabletop scanner for something like a GI Joe size parts, you know, where you could you could scan in, you know, something about the size of an action figure and then be able to print that. But they're not as clean as CAD drawings. And you can kind of see that in this rendering of a scanned person kind of standing there. Some of the guys will take their old Xboxes with a connect kinetic. It's kind of that uh, we type interface and turn their old Xboxes into scanners for 3D printing. Slicing software is what we are using to be able to prepare for 3D printing. If you come from a machine shop environment, slicing software can be thought of as computer-aided manufacturing. That's what generates the G codes for 3D printing. And they are working with different softwares like our Dremel 3D printer, and here are some other ones. Cura is another software that we have available and it should be on my computer. I asked them to load it. So let me see if it does go. So here's the Ultimaker Cura app. And if I open that, So here's a different slicing software, and this is the Ultimaker slicing software. And they keep changing these, but they essentially work the same. I can go and I can load my models. And so I can go here to open, and then I could go into my 2021 CAD 107. Here's my chip clip. And then here's my part, and they work very similar. The difference with, uh, with the Cura software and with um, the Dremel software is that we have two extruder heads. And so as we start getting into dual color applications, this is when it gets really cool. And we can actually get into five color applications if we use our palette system. So with that, if I'm in Thingiverse, you can also go here and you can go and you can search for dual extrusion. And you can get some dual extruded parts. And I did this tree frog. I don't know where I put it. It's around here somewhere. Um, and this is a great little application that you can see where you can assign one different colors to one of the heads and the other different color to the other. The best way to pick up on how to do dual extrusion is YouTube. So if I go here, YouTube, and I type in Cura dual extrusion. You can see I've been here before. They have some great videos on how to assign printer heads for dual extrusion. And it's not that difficult. And so if you guys are interested in doing that and want to come in and use the Ultimakers, that's fine. Like I said, just instant message us or email us. Let us know so that we can have that machine ready to go for you. But essentially what you do when you do dual extrusion is you assign a printer head to a part in the model. Those of you who do SolidWorks, when you create these models, you will not merge your 3D shapes. You'll keep them separate. Those of you who do ARCAD will keep them on separate layers. And we'll turn off one layer and we'll turn on another layer. This is not super easy. It's an advanced application, but I want to show everybody as these are like our slicing softwares. Some of the other programs that are available, um, I have one other ones. I'm sure it's noticed in here. I'll, it'll pop into my head in a little bit. And then you can simulate your print. And so essentially, as you go through, you can see what that's going to look like. You can set up your print quality and layer heights. And it does talk about layer heights and nozzles and extrusions. These are things that we can get into in more advanced applications. Platform adhesion is important. Make sure that you read through this. As we go through and we look at platform adhesions, we can look at how brims work. We can also look at bridging. Bridging is how much you can print without any support material. Skirts also put down more adhesion to the build plate. And wraps probably put the most material onto the build plate. And I'm just simplifying it to be um, kind of expedient so that we don't overdo this video and make it too long because the material is here for you to read. And for me to just read it to you, I don't think that really helps. So as you go through, when you work with a dual head extruder, you can set it up so that one of the support materials is water soluble, and then you can make things that you really can't make any other way than on a 3D printer. Orientation is very important. As we look at the orientation, rotate it 90 degrees. 
We have to resize it. You can see there's quite a bit of support material here. And it's increased from real time by about 20 minutes. So this is not the ideal way to print. But on the other hand, what some people will do is they'll make sure that the side that's on glass is the high quality side because you'll get a nice smooth layer for the first layer because it's on glass versus some of these other layers which will appear kind of blocky like this as you go through. And it's down to how you're going to finish what kind of quality that you want on the, on the overall design of the part. Some of them will print up like this. These will be used for things like lithoplane boxes where you'll have some transparent applications where you can put lighting in it. You can see that. This talks a little bit about a bridging. And some of these things about putting here. And we'll talk about infill, and that's where we'll leave it for today. As we look at infill, we can adjust the infill patterns. They have different patterns like these type of patterns here. We can have like a, a honeycomb pattern. We can alter the density of that pattern. And if I was to go and, and look at this part and infill on it, it's not really too, there we go. That's where we can see our infill. It prints it kind of a honeycomb type of an application. And then you can adjust the infill patterns within your slicing software. Here's my support. Here's my material. Here's my infill list where I can find, here it is, infill pattern. So if I want to change it from a zigzag grid to so with, uh, something like this, you have to re-slice it. And then you can see the pattern. We can go with other patterns. Let's go with um, concentric 3D. And this works well for a semi-transfer application. We might have some light ditching, we might have some type of pattern. OK, so that's the first half of chapter 3. I'm going to end the video, and then we're going to open things up for questions.